Jordan in the Mass House of Representatives, representing the 6th School District, and serves as House Chairman of the Joint Committee on Labor and Workforce Development. He's also an attorney and a former newspaper editor. He's a graduate of State Moore College, Suffolk Law, and the University of Massachusetts at Dartmouth, where he has a master's degree in environmental policy. Cutler is the author of Mob Town Massacre, Alexander H Hansen in the Baltimore Wall Newspaper Award of 1812, winner of the 2020 Baltimore History Prize. He is not caught on the trail of 19th century abolitionist firebrands or federalist agitators. Cutler enjoys photography, traveling, hiking, and spending time with his children. So, Josh Cutler. All right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hey folks, thank you, uh, David. Thanks for for hosting, and thanks to the, the Women Public Library for for inviting me in to talk today. I'm really glad to be here. I you know represent the town of Handsome next door, so I I feel a special uh, connection to the town of Whitman, and uh, appreciative of, of all the stuff uh, that you guys do here, and what a great library that you have, and how important it is to support our libraries, especially these days, in in a time when you know people are needing more remote services and, and, and costs are going up and libraries are the cheapest and best uh, deal around. So, so, so thank you. Um, so what I wanted to do today was just kind of talk a little bit about um, the book and why I think it's relevant and important and um, we'll have it, we'll kind of keep it informal. Uh, we have a nice intimate crowd and uh, happy to take questions uh, you know, at the end or along the way, whatever, you, whatever your preference is. And we, are, we want to thank Whitman Hanson Community Access for, um, for broadcasting or taping the, the program today. I look forward to being able to see that on my TV screen as well. So uh, sound good? Now I typically need uh, a couple of, at one point in my presentation I have a place where I need a volunteer. Um, and there's a female line and a male line. So I need a, a woman volunteer or someone who wants to pretend to be Mariah Chapman. So when we get to that point, hopefully someone will come in who can fill that role. If not, I'm gonna have to call on you, one of you guys. David, you may have to pinch hit. Um, because we have, a we have an audience participation part of the presentation, okay? Just giving you a fair warning. You can, you can head out right now, all right? I'm just kidding, don't do that. We good? All right. So, um, so again, just by way of background, I'm, I'm Josh Cutler. I'm a state rep over in Hanson. And uh, a couple years ago, uh, I wrote a book called um, uh, Mob Town Massacre, which is all about Alexander Hanson, who is the namesake for the town of Hanson. And um, you know, folks you know, around here, as you know, many of our town names are, are named after Mother England or uh, Native American uh, connections. And the town of Hanson is named after a 19th century Baltimore newspaper publisher. And so, you know, I always thought that would be a fun story to tell because it's such an unusual um, event. And so I um, spent a good amount of time researching what happened and wrote uh, a book, Mob Town Massacre, which came out in actually in 2019, so pre-COVID. Pre um, and um, I have copies of the book here. I encourage you to take a look at that. That's all about what happened uh, during the War of 1812 and why Alexander Hansen, who was a, a Federalist newspaper editor, and what his connection to the, the little town of Hansen is and how it got to be named after him. So um, that's what kind of drew me into uh, the, the writing side of this. Um, I consider myself a, an amateur historian. Um, but uh, and so as a follow-up, um, I wrote this book, uh, uh, The Boston Gentleman's Mom, Mariah Chapman and the Abolition Riot of 1835 which also it has some of the same elements of, of um, good morning. Oh, we have, a, our, we have our volunteer who's just got designated to be, to be, the, uh, to be the voice of Mariah Chapman. Uh, <laughs> hey, guys. Good morning. Thanks for stopping by. Um, so um, that led me to, to this book. And uh, I just came out. I'm really excited about it. It's all about the, uh, uh, an event that happened right on the streets of Boston in 1835. And it had a seminal effect on the abolitionist movement here in Boston and really throughout the country. And uh, it's not a, an event we know a whole lot about. And so my book is all about what happened on that day. And so I think it, it's a pretty interesting story. Some, there's a lot of drama. There's chases. There's, uh, there's a violence. There's, uh, there's all kinds of drama. So it's a, it's a fun story. So I'm going to uh, walk through some slides and kind of share you a little bit about it. And then I'm going to stop and uh, glad to uh, take questions or talk about anything that you might have. Um, Hey guys, I, as I warned the audience, there's one point in, where, in this presentation where I have a little bit of audience participation. <laughs> and we need a male voice and a female voice. And we were kind of hoping someone would come along. And you know, I can't think of anyone better than Shannon O'Brien oh, to fulfill this. Oh, no, nope, to fulfill this. So when you get to this point, you're going you're to realize you are the perfect person to speak this line. Right. So uh, with that, with that uh, little build up. So um, Mariah Chapman and the Boston Gentleman's Mob. Let's, there we go. So who was Mariah Chapman? 
So I want you to close your eyes for just a moment, if you would, or pretend like you're closing your eyes if you prefer. And uh, picture yourself at the Unitarian Church on Federal Street in Boston. It's the fall of 1835. You can open up your eyes again. Outside, you can hear the, the creaking of horse carriages along Federal Street, which is still made of compressed dirt. Gas streetlights remain a novelty, and most streets are still illuminated with oil lamps. Our current president is Andrew Jackson. Daniel Webster is our U.S. Senator. The mayor of Boston is a man named Theodore Lyman. And Boston is dominated by the Whig Party. Now, it's a tense time in the nation. Political unrest, racial division, and mob violence are common. One of your fellow parishioners is a young woman named Mariah Weston Chapman. Her father-in-law is a prosperous ship chandler, and his family pew is, is probably down front in a prominent spot. Mariah comes from more modest means. Uh, she grew up in the small town of, of Weymouth, right here in the South Shore, as the oldest of eight siblings. Her father was a sailor turned farmer, and uh, she had a comfortable upbringing, though certainly not uh, the wealth of her distant relative, uh, Ezra Weston of Duxbury, who was the shipping magnate known as King Caesar. Now, you may not have noticed Mariah at first. She had slight features and come, could come across as, as quiet and intense. Some even found her somewhat cold at first. But she was also self-confident, determined, and very intelligent. One, phrase, one uh, friend praised her morals and intellect, but acknowledged that her charms were not always readily apparent. Quote, it takes time to thaw the ice of her exterior, but then you are carried away by the torrent. I've always liked that, that uh, quote. So Mariah is now 28 years old. She had recently joined a women's anti-slavery society in Boston and had quickly become a growing force behind the scenes. Her husband was a committed abolitionist before they were married, but Mariah held strong anti-slavery views even as a young woman. All right. A growing influence was William Lloyd Garrison, the radical publisher of the Liberator newspaper in Boston. The paper was launched January 1st, 1831, and Garrison made clear that when it came to speaking out against slavery, he would pull no punches. Here's his famous quote. I will be as harsh as truth and as uncompromising as justice. On this subject, I do not wish to equivocate, excuse me, I do not wish to think or speak or write with moderation. No, no, I am in earnest. I will not equivocate. I will not excuse. I will not retreat a single inch, and I will be heard. These are the famous words with, which he published in his first issue of The Liberator, uh, which came uh, to be known as the most prominent abolitionist newspaper in the country. Now, Garrison was a proponent of immediate emancipation of all enslaved persons. Now, this is the uh, copy of the masthead. If you've seen copies of The Liberator, it, looks, it may look familiar to you. Now, Mariah was also a strong believer in uh, the concept of an immediate emancipation, but her progressive, view, her progressive views were not always shared widely in Boston or even in, in her relatively progressive uh, Unitarian church. While most of the city's establishment frowned on the practice of slavery, many still benefited from its practice, whether directly or indirectly. The city's prosperous cotton textile industry, in particular, benefited from raw cotton cultivated with the labor of enslaved persons in the South. <laughs> The growing abolitionist movement, and especially the unyielding and uncompromising views of immediate abolitionists like Garrison and Chapman, did not sit well with much of establishment Boston. The issue came to the head in 1835 when abolitionists launched a public campaign against slavery. They flooded the southern states with anti-slavery literature. It became known as the Great Postal Campaign. And sadly, the effort mostly backfired. <laughs> it led to violence in the South, in Charlestown, Carol uh, South Carolina, it's depicted here. Uh, uh, rioters burned, uh, stole the sacks of mail from the post office and burned an effigy of Garrison on the streets. In Boston, the city leaders were worried. They called for a citywide meeting at Faneuil Hall to reject the abolitionist aims and express support for their Southern brethren. The meeting was chaired by the mayor, Theodore Lyman, and 1,500 of the city's most respectable gentlemen attended. 
One of them is Harrison Gray Otis, a name that may be familiar to some of you, who's one of Boston's wealthiest and best known political leaders. Others included Francis Cabot Lowell, Lemuel Shattuck, and Amos Lawrence. Uh, Peleg Sprague, who's pictured here, was a Duxbury native who was a uh, U.S. Senator from the state of Maine and had recently resettled to Boston, and he also participated. Now, Mariah Chapman and a number of women in, in, in Boston um, had recently been, been meeting to form a new anti-slavery society in Boston called the Boston Female Anti-Slavery Society. It was formed in 1833. Originally, it was just comprised of white women, but William Lloyd Garrison objected to this, declaring it, quote, shocking to my feelings that the members of an anti-slavery society would themselves be the slaves of a vulgar and insane prejudice. Now, Garrison's lesson was quickly heated, and uh, the women admitted uh, several African-American women to their society, including Susan Paul, uh, who was a prominent uh, uh, woman in her own right in Boston at the time. We don't have any photos of Susan Paul, unfortunately. Uh, her, her sister, Anne Catherine, is to the left, and her niece, Susan Thomas Paul, uh, is to the right. Um, and Chapman became very active with this group. Um, the church uh, where they met the, is now the M Museum of African American History on Beacon Hill. Some of you may have stopped by. It's a great little museum. And so the, uh, Mariah Chapman and the women of the Boston Anti-Slavery Society uh, scheduled their meeting in the city of Boston uh, in mid-October of 1835. Uh, but unfortunately, they couldn't find a venue that would hold them. All of the uh, local merchants None of the local merchants wanted to be associated with the Women's Society and objected to any association, so um, they refused to allow the women to meet there. Um, one, one local newspaper summed up the views thusly, quote, has it come to this that the women of our country, not content with their proper sphere, the domestic fireside, must have public meetings to encourage a foreign emissary to destroy our peace? Are there not sufficient deluded men already engaged in the work of abolition that the interference of females may be dispensed with. So that sort of summed up the view to these women in much of the city's establishment at that time, sadly. But the women finally made uh, arrangements to host their meeting and uh, they helped to publicize it. It was going to be held right here um, off of um, Washington Street in downtown Boston. And on the morning of their meeting, which was October 21st, 1835, this handbill was circulated around the city and in local newspapers. The rumor was that this gentleman, who was George Thompson, who was a British abolitionist, would be speaking at the women's meeting. He was one of the few men that was more despised than William Lloyd Garrison at the time. The handbill offered $100 bounty for Thompson, and it was paid for by a group of local businessmen. It didn't seem to matter that the newspaper and the handbill were false. In fact, Thompson would not be at the women's meeting. He was not even at the city at the time. But as Garrison himself would later write, quote, the whole city was now wrought up in a pitch of insanity. So you can see an image of William Lloyd Garrison there on the left, surrounded by the mob of men. So the women's meeting was held on a Wednesday afternoon on the third floor of a commercial building on Washington Street, uh, right around the corner from the old State House. Some of you, I know some of you have, have been there. It was an unseasonably warm day, and the, the handbill quickly had its intended effect. A, ga a crowd gathered outside and quickly grew in size and intensity. Now, the leaders of the mob, as you can see here, were among the city's leading residents. They were bankers, merchants, tradesmen, some militia members. They wore fine broadcloth, camlet coats, casimirs, and beaver hats. Quote, I have kept a hat store for 30 years and never saw so many good hats before in my life, one local hat seller later said. Now, this cartoon right here, my sound effects. This scene right here depicts the uh, scene outside of the office. Uh, it was a, a cartoon drawn, we think, contemporaneously with the event. And you can see the anti-slavery office where the women were meeting. The men were tearing down the sign and throwing things. Um, and you can see some of the comments here. It's a little hard to read, but I'll, I'll read one to you. Um, 
the, um, it said, quote, down with the damned abolitionists. The peace of the city is destroyed. Lynch them, lynch them, it read in a mocking tone. <coughs> All right, so now I need my volunteer. So who was in my male volunteer? It was one of you gentlemen, right? No? No. All right, come on up. And Shannon, I need you, I, you gotta be my, although I see Jackie in the back, so, but I, so Mariah Chapman. Switch. Yeah, you should switch, come on over here. All right, so what, here's what happened. Uh, the women started their meeting up in the lecture hall, uh, up on, on, the, uh, on the third floor. The crowd of men had filled up the hallways and had you know, kind of thronged the, the, the entryway. And they yelled obscenities and were yelling and screaming at the women. Some even hurled uh, orange peels uh, at the women. Um, William Lloyd Garrison was one of the few men inside the hall. So picture you guys uh, are here. All the men are trying to break in. And William Lloyd Garrison is sitting with all of the women. Um, and at one point, he turns to aggress the crowd of men in the back. And he says, quote, gentlemen, perhaps you are not aware this is a meeting of the Boston Female Anti-Slavery Society, called and intended exclusively for ladies. Understanding this fact, you will not be so rude or indecorous as to thrust your presence upon this meeting. If, gentlemen, any of you ladies in disguise, why, only apprise me of that fact, give me your names, and I will introduce you to the rest of your sex, and you can take your seats among them accordingly. He needled. So, you can imagine, uh, the crowd did not take well to those kind of uh, biting comments from William Lloyd Garrison. And uh, he really, he quickly realized that his presence was really uh, ex exacerbating the situation, so he decided to leave. Um, he did not want the women to, he did not want to end endanger the women with his presence. So uh, at around the same time, the mayor of the city arrived, uh, Mayor Lyman, um, and he told the women to go home. He feared that he could not control the growing mob, and he was concerned for their safety. Now, most of the women uh, agreed to leave. They, you know, they, were, they, they, they understood the situation, but Mariah Chapman did not agree. She was offended that the mayor had come and asked them to leave and that he could not control this crowd. And so, she, so they had a confrontation. This is the, the confrontation. This is the exact quotes that were said. So Mayor Lyman is going to read the quote first. Ladies, do you wish to see a scene of bloodshed and confusion? If you do not, go home. All right, and then Mariah Chapman responds. Mr. Lyman, your personal friends are the instigators of this mob. Have you ever used your personal influence with them? And then Mayor Lyman. I know no personal friends. I am merely an official. Indeed, ladies, you must retire. It is dangerous to remain. If this is the last bulwark of freedom, we may as well die here as anywhere. Well done. All right. Uh, you guys, my volunteers can sit down. Thank you. Very well done. That was actually, I've done this a few times. That was actually one of the best ones uh, that we've had. So that, you, that was good. Excellent. Uh, so Mariah Chapman's uh, words became an abolitionist rallying cry. And in fact, you can Google them. You, you know, they're, they're often quoted uh, comments attributed to her. Uh, which happened right here in this, this confrontation between herself and the mayor. So Mariah remained resolute. Uh, she really didn't want to give in to um, this, this gentleman's mob, but she you know, reluctantly agreed for the safety of the women to, to leave the meeting. So she helped lead the women downstairs. Um, okay, one more, yeah, okay, whoops. Hold on, hold on to that. She helped lead the women downstairs uh, out onto the street. Um, she couldn't see through all the throbs of men, but she could you know, make her, well, her way well enough. And she arranged for the women to, mar to march in a procession uh, down Washington Street, walking arm in arm with their black members to offer a measure of protection and, and, and a measure of defiance as well. Uh, she said, quote, two and two to Hollis Street, each with a colored friend, she wrote, she said. <clears throat> the sight of the women boldly marching in arms, black and white, side to side, drew hisses from the men in the crowd. They continued their jeering, uh, but sufficiently parted to allow the women to advance. Now, the original group had been about 25 women uh, who were upstairs in the meeting, but that number swelled to uh, as many more, 12, swelled to over 50 as many more women joined them uh, in, their, um, in their effort. So Chapman marched, uh, she marched down, south, uh, down Washington Street with her colleagues and um, she was disgusted by what she saw. There were hundreds and hundreds of men arrayed on both sides of the street. These were the wealthy and respectable of Boston, men of, quote, influence and standing, 
She said, quote, We saw the faces of those we had, till now, thought friends, men whom we never had met before without giving a hand and friendly salutation, men whom till now we should have called upon for condemnation of ruffianism. So Garrison uh, had left the meeting and climbed out a back window, and the crowd gave chase to him quickly. He fled to a local carpenter's shop uh, and tried to, hide, to, tried to hide under a pile of lumber and wood chips in the corner. But he was, uh, he was quickly found and dragged out um, uh, of, the, of, uh, of the building and dragged along the road to the old state house. Mariah Chapman was unaware of what was happening and had already returned to her home, which was on West Street in downtown Boston, to wait for news. She had a steady stream of visitors uh, to the house, and not all were friendly. One group of men came and warned Chapman's husband that they knew the names of his commercial trade partners in the South and were prepared to thwart his business dealings by outing his strident anti-slavery views. At one point, the sheriff's deputy arrived offering a condescending comment to Mariah about his brushes with the mob, as if to emphasize the potential peril he was facing. He said, quote, I speak as a man just from a mob, he reminded her, but Mariah would have none of that. She said, quote, and I listen as a woman just from a mob, she retorted. But her younger su sister summed it up best in her diary entry that day, quote, this is to be remembered as the day 5,000 men mobbed 45 women. As you can see, Garrison here being depicted uh, being dragged along the streets uh, by a rope, and the men intended to bring him to the frog pond in Boston Common to tar and feather him. Um, and um, Garrison was rescued sort of at the last moment by a couple of other uh, men who, who jumped in. Um, but it was quite a, a dire scene for, for a while. Is that the last one? Okay. So, so what happens next is really with the subject of, of what I've written the book about. So I'm going to kind of stop here as my tease. Um, I don't want to get too, too much into that, but it, it suffice to say it was quite a compelling story what happened uh, that day. Garrison had to be brought to the city jail to be protected. He was almost killed. Um, and really, uh, this incident had a wide, uh, you know, wide-ranging impact on the city of Boston and uh, really the abolitionist movement across the country. And, uh, and I'm going to um, give you one example of that, and then I'll kind of stop and we can open up the floor. But one of the people who was, um, one of the young men who was in the streets that day, his name was Wendell Phillips, and some of you may know, who may, may know that name. Uh, he was a young attorney who had recently um, opened his practice uh, in Boston. He was uh, a prominent aristocratic, uh, came from a prominent aristocratic family. His father, in fact, had been one of the first mayors of the, of the city of Boston. And he worked alongside some other young attorneys, uh, John Winthrop, maybe a familiar name to some, or Charles Sumner, some of you people may know Charles Sumner. Um, Wendell Phillips was a graduate of uh, Boston Latin, Harvard College, Harvard Law School. He was the son of the, the first mayor, as I mentioned, came from a wealthy family. He was uh, you know, described as, quote, strikingly handsome, refined and charming, and the proud leader of the aristocracy. In all ways, he was an example of, um, of the men that were on the streets you know, mobbing these women. But Phillips, um, he, he heard the crowd. He went out and uh, looked in the streets and saw the men. Uh, gathered around, and uh, he, he, he wondered what was going on. He wasn't really involved in the abolitionist movement, and uh, he, he, kind of, um, he, he kind of looked at, was viewing it all very skeptically. And he, he saw his friend, and he said, quote, Why does the mayor not call out the regiment? We would cheerfully take arms in such a case as this. It is a very shameful business. Why does the mayor stand there arguing? Why does he not call for the guns? His friend gestured to the crowd, advising his colleague that the mob and the militia were one and the same. It was a chilling realization for Phillips, and the memory st stuck with him for the rest of his life. And in fact, later on, Wendell Phillips went on to become probably the leading, uh, one of the leading abolitionist voices of his generation. Uh, there's a statue of Wendell Phillips 
in Boston Common today. You can see, uh, and if you, if you uh, Google his name, you'll see he had a really remarkable career uh, fighting abolitionists, fighting for uh, abolition and really a range of social causes uh, throughout his, his life. And it was all because of this incident that happened on this day, October 21st, 1835, when he just happened to wa wander outside of his uh, law office and watch this spectacle uh, unfold. Um, Charles Sumner was also, uh, this also had an a, 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 um, indelible impact on Charles Sumner, who went on obviously to become a U.S. Senator, one of the leading abolition, abolitionist voices uh, of, his, um, of the whole century. Um, so, um, but I wanted to bring it back to kind of wrap it up with Mariah Chapman, because she's kind of the star of our show. Uh, and she went on to have a really illustrious career. She took over management of um, many of the Boston Female Anti-Slavery Society efforts. She led uh, the anti-slavery fair, growing it into a major fundraising vehicle. And she wrote the annual society's, society's annual report, which was a, a major um, uh, piece of um, literature that was used by the abolitionists. Uh, she became really known as Garrison's key uh, lieutenant, uh, or as one critic later described her as Gable, Garrison's evil genius. Uh, one would later refer to her as, as Captain Chapman, or Joan of our Ark. Um, and uh, she was, you know, she was a hardcore believer in abolitionism. She was, in fact, she was skeptical of Abraham Lincoln. Um, even after the Civil War began, she objected to Lincoln's plan to compensate uh, slave owners who remained loyal to the Union cause. She said, quote, think of it, our grandchildren paying off Southern claims of this kind. It stinks in the nostril of people, she wrote. But in the years after the Civil War, she, uh, she, uh, her views changed. She stepped back from her public advocacy and continued to support women's rights in, in a number of other ways. Um, but really, the events of October 31st, 1835, had an indelible mark on her career and really served as a crucible that shaped her views of the entire anti-slavery movement for the rest of her life. Uh, she, in fact, she, Many years later, in 1881, so flashing forward you know, uh, to 1881, she wrote to another abolitionist friend and uh, still vividly recalled even the smallest details of the gentleman's mob nearly a half century later. Uh, Mariah Chapman lived in Weymouth with her uh, surviving sisters and family and uh, kept up with her correspondence with her old abolitionist friends, but otherwise lived her later years mostly as a, a recluse. Uh, by the summer of 1885, Chapman began to experience, uh, quote, gastric difficulty and, and lost her appetite. And she eventually died July 12th of 1885, just shy of her 79th birthday. Officially, she died of heart disease. After all the speeches and, uh, and uh, funeral remarks were made, a series of letters was read in Chapman's honor, many from guests who were unable to attend in person. They praised her leadership, her drive, dedication, and reminisced about the fatal the fateful gentleman's mob in the early days of the abolitionist movement, agreeing that of this band, she was the recognized queen. So I will stop there. Um, thank you for giving me a chance to kind of talk a little bit about uh, this day and what uh, it meant for the city of Boston. Um, I really enjoyed having the chance to dig into this uh, subject matter. I think it's a fascinating kind of window on um, our city, our region, uh, at a particular time in history. I think we think of, number one, we think of uh, Boston as being a hotbed of the abolitionist movement. Uh, at that time, it really was not. In fact, the city was very hostile to the abolitionists. Obviously, over time, those views change. And the other thing I think is really interesting about this incident is that we think of typically, in the 19th century, we think of mobs as being sort of the ruffians, you know, the working classes. This was really a mob led by the elite, the elites of the city, the bankers, the tradesmen, who were the ones that were the leaders of this, of this mob, which is unusual at that time. So those are a couple of reasons why I think this is a really notable um, event in our history. I've really enjoyed reading about it. I hope uh, you'll have a chance to check out the book. Uh, and um, I'm happy to, to stop here and kind of open the floor up if, any, anybody, if anybody has any comments or questions uh, about, um, about this or about any of the things we've talked about. Shannon. One. Yes. Kind thank you for and thank you for walking in and not even knowing what I'm talking about and agreeing to be the volunteer. So. <laughs> um, a. I. Why did you pick this topic, or how did you, you know, come across it? And two, never having really done original research myself, you know, um, even in college, you know, when you're writing papers, I've never done what obviously you've done, which is go to original sources. How did you find those original sources? Talk to me. A. What made you think about this topic? But B. 
how did you get those quotes? I mean, obviously there's a lot more letter writing, but where do you find them? Right, so the great question. So um, I think right before you came in, I was talking about a little bit about, um, I had written a book uh, back in 2019 called Mob Town Massacre, which is about Alexander Hansen, who is the namesake for our neighboring town of Hansen. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was, I always, you know, was someone who represents the town of Hansen, it had been in Hansen for a long time. I was always curious about the story because, as I was saying before, you know, so many of our town names in New England are either Mother England or Native American connections. Mm -hmm. uh, and Hansen was named after a newspaper publisher from Maryland. So, you know, like that's just, that doesn't seem, you know, what, what, there must be a story there. Mm -hmm. And so there is a great story there. Um, and, and I, you know, I, I wrote it. Um, and so that kind of led me into this idea. This was about a newspaper publisher who um, defended his newspaper against a mob and, uh, during the War of 1812. And so after I finished that book, I was sort of looking for the next project and uh, loved the idea. You know, I love journalism and politics and, and the intersection of all those kind of ideas. And this was a sort of right in the sweet spot because it was about William Lloyd Garrison and the you know, radical newspaper publisher, uh, about the politics in the city at that time. And so it was very appealing to me um, as sort of a semi-sequel to what I had done um, the, the first book. Um, and, uh, and then it had a lot of local connections too, which made it neat. Maria, Maria Chapman was from Weymouth. You know, there were, the abolitionist movement was all over the South Shore here. And obviously, you know, the action took place in, in Boston. In terms of the second question, um, you know, we're really fortunate. Um, public, our public libraries are really, you know, it's so important. I was talking about that a moment ago. Um, I did most of the research for this during the pandemic. And, you know, because if you're the local state rep and you don't have to go to an event every night, like you have all this time on your hands with Zooms. And so I poured it into doing this project and was able to do a lot of the research um, online. Boston Public Library has an amazing trove of letters from that era. Um, there are thousands, you know, people wrote letters every day, um, you know, with the way we, we write emails. And so there's thousands of letters that have been preserved, you know, not, sadly not all of them. Um, and you can go on and read the original letters. And, you know, it, it can be painstaking because some of the letters are hard to, to read. You know, I, I thought I had bad, bad handwriting. Um, but, um, but, you know, you, you, can, you, can, you can plow through them and, and, and really piece together things that are, um, really can paint a, a vivid portrayal of what happened on a particular day, you know, that was 200 years ago. Uh, people wrote such volum voluminous letters. So that's what really allowed me to do that. So really, I credit um, our libraries in general, and the Boston Public Library was really the one that I relied on the most. But, a, you know, the, the Boston Athenaeum, I used the Dyer Library in, in Abington, um, really um, all over the place, wherever I could find uh, so in the, letters. The, in, in the Abington Library, what, what, what's there? Mm -hmm. So they have, the, they have a special, I don't know if you've been there, the Dyer Library in, in Abington is a great, um, they have a lot of, um, it's one of the, it's a great, you know, sort of a regional um, library for, for, you know, 19th century sources. Um, they have original copies of the Liberator newspaper, for instance, oh, wow. um, which, is, um, the, which is what I referenced here. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, they have the last public, uh, excuse me, the last printed edition of the Liberator there which is kind of neat. Um, there's letters, there's pamphlets, you know, there's a lot of uh, documentations and sources from back then that you can look to. Um, so really letters was probably the, the, the first and foremost. Um, there's some other public documents that were shared. And then the second biggest source is newspapers because, you know, there were 12 newspapers in Boston at the city at that time. And, um, you know, they all, they were very different than what we look at today. I see Jackie here is a journalist herself. Um, but, um, you know, they, they, were, they had, a lot of information as well, sort of. So great first, first draft, rough, rough draft of history as they say for newspapers and between the letters and the, and the newspapers, I was able to piece together a lot of, of what happened. And that's the fun part and, and, and occasionally the challenging part, you know, I think um, uh, sometimes we're not able to tell the story, like Susan Paul, I think is an impressive, very impressive woman. And, you know, she didn't, we didn't, she didn't, we don't have a lot of her letters. We don't have a lot of documentation about her life. And I feel like. What did she do? You, and I, I meant so I kind of glossed over her a little bit because it's just in the interest of time. But she was a, a woman, um, her father was, um, had helped to found the African Methodist Church on Beacon Hill and uh, Reverend Paul. And she was in her own right, you know, a very prominent abolitionist. She was a school teacher. Uh, she had grown up in poverty herself. Um, but she was a school teacher and she used, you know, she very cleverly used the lyrics that she taught to her choir students to, to, to teach anti-slavery lessons. Um, she, she, um, she wrote a biography of, a, of, a, of one of her students and she's credited with being the first African American to write a, a biography in, in American history. So she was a really uh, interesting person. Sadly, she died at a young age. She actually, um, 
she had to travel to New York for a convention and she had to travel in steerage because she was African American. She wasn't able to travel you know, with the, you know, the rest of the passengers. She caught cold, got tuberculosis, we think, and uh, never recovered from that. Um, so um, her, her life was kind of cut short and there's not a lot of public sourcing of all the letters. There's a couple letters that she wrote, but we don't have as much as I feel like she deserves. So sometimes that, the historical record is great, sometimes it falls up short um, on occasion. And that was one. Yeah. Um, any other questions or comments? Anybody have any feedback or um, thing they're curious about? So um, I have copies of the book here. Happy to uh, sign them or sell them. Um, as I usually do, if you want to buy a copy, uh, we donate the proceeds to the, to the local um, friends of the library, uh, in this case, the Whitman Public Library. So I'm happy to, uh, to do that. And I have copies of the Mob Town Massacre, which is a book about uh, Alexander Hansen, if you're curious about your neighbors over in Hansen and how that town got to be named that way. Um, it's an interesting story. So, uh, One more time on the floor. I don't want to uh, cut anybody short, but I appreciate a chance to, uh, to uh, come and, and join with all of you. And uh, thanks for being a hearty, uh, a hearty crowd. So we'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you.